But let's say it is truly your prostate. How do we treat that? Back in the old days, TUR, the prostate, was the bread and butter of urology. They would, our practice would probably do them every day. One of the docs would be in doing them. That's been replaced by medication, which is now the bread and butter of BPH. And we know that the, the number one drugs that are used are the alpha adrenergic blockers. So we're blocking muscle tone. We're causing a muscle in the bladder neck to relax. And by opening that bladder neck, it makes it easier to urinate. And there's a group of drugs called alpha-1 and alpha-1A that are what we use the most of. So they decrease bladder outlet resistance by, as I said, opening that up. The alpha-1s are found everywhere. So they're in our cardiovascular system, so they're more generalized, but they're in the prostate area. They're in the bladder neck, so this will work. The alpha-1As are a little bit more fine-tuned to just that bladder area, so they're more specific receptors. So our alpha-1s are Cardura, doxyzosin, and Hytrin, terazosin. So this was like amazing when these drugs came out because Minipress was one of the first ones that was used. I don't, anybody remember using that in their practice? I mean, it was real early on. I don't think we ever used it, but you know, when these other two came out, we used it a ton, and it really works. It works fast, which is a nice thing. Um, again, because they're so nonspecific, we have to start at very low dosages. That's why they come in these range. And it was a, a, a pain to have to write these prescriptions because you'd write one milligram QHS times three days, two milligrams QHS, you know, then, 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 until you got up to the dose that you would hopefully try to get up to, which was the highest dose. We gave it at night because if they're going to, you know, have the highest release, we don't want it to be when they're walking around, so when they're sleeping. Um, Anyway, they worked really well, but we did have to worry about things like orthostatic hypotension. So then the alpha-1A adrenergic blockers came into being, and good old Flomax was the first one out of that group, or Tamsulosin. I've gotten to the point now that I don't even remember Flomax sometimes. The generics are the more common name, so it's Tamsulosin to me. It comes in 0.4. It can be pushed up to two pills, and best dose a half hour after meal, so you have a little bit of stomach uh, content to help aid absorption. The uroxetrol, alpha zosin, both of these are generic. It comes in one dose, 10 milligrams, so you're kind of just one option. And then the only one that's not a generic right now is Rapaflow. I'm not sure how much longer it has. I don't know if anybody knows that in the room, but it's been around for a while, so it won't be that long. And it comes in two doses, four and eight. Eight milligram is the dose typically used to treat most of our prostate problems the four milligrams for people that have some renal or hepatic insufficiencies. And these are the game changers. They will work on many patients. There's other ways to do this. We can actually take that big old prostate and shrink it. And we do that with the drug called 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. They block testosterone from being converted to dihydrotestosterone. In one of our talks, somebody had mentioned that's like the supercharged testosterone. So it does a few things. It, it causes our prostates to get big, and it causes our hair to get less. So more prostate, less hair. Does that mean every bald guy's got a huge prostate? No. There is some genetics behind all this. But so when you give them these drugs, you get sometimes, if the, it's like a slight hair loss, they'll come back and they'll say, wow, I'm urinating well and my hair looks great. So they do grow some hair back. Um, Problem is, these drugs don't work fast. I mean, six months, nine months to really see a change, and you have to stay on it because as soon as you go off it, your prostate starts growing again. Very few side effects. Impotence, I don't know that I really think that, but I think they throw it in there because guys complain when they can't ejaculate any, um, you know, decreased volume in their ejaculation, and sometimes decreased sex drive. Uh, but for the most part, I haven't had too many patients complain of any problems. Now, the other side, we were talking about the alphas, like the, your tamsulosin. A lot of guys that are younger complain about the drug because it opens the bladder neck so well that when they ejaculate, nothing comes out. And that's because it flows backwards into their bladder. So we just try to tell them, well, that's what we wanted it to do. Sometimes the uroxetrol um, will work better and have less of that. So there's only two drugs in this category, so this is the easy one to remember. You better get it right on the test if you're going to take your certification exam, and you will if you're... Who's not certified? Oh, okay. Look at you guys. You can all get certified. 
Uh, proscar or finasteride, again, another one I don't remember the proscar too often anymore. Finasteride, five milligrams, one dose. And avidart dutasteride, 0 0.5 milligrams. Both drugs are generic. Finasteride has been for quite a while. Dutasteride just recently turned generic. Both do the same thing. They think dutasteride has a dual way to do it, so it works a little faster. I'm not so sure. But they also affect the PSA. Now, remember, we talked about PSA as a screening tool for prostate cancer, so this will lower your PSA, making PSA probably a less effective screening tool, except it's been well documented that the, the decrease is very consistent. It'll half it. So if your PSA is, you know, three, you come in, hey, my PSA is three, it's great, but I've been on finasteride for the past year. Your PSA is six. We're going to multiply it by two. So you may actually be somebody that's going to be screened. So just keep that in mind, and it's perfectly safe to use. If one drug is good, two must be great, right? That's what a lot of our patients think. And there is com uh, good studies that go along that combination therapy using the, the five alpha reductase inhibitors along with the alpha adrenergic blockers work better than the single agent. And there is one drug out there called Jalen that you know, takes your peanut butter and your chocolate at once and you get your Reese's peanut butter cup. Just for completion, patients like to use a lot of these over-the-counter things. So phytotherapies, your plant therapies are used. The sal palmetto is the big one that seems to work. I mean, it's basically a form of finasteride, but, but what, what are you getting in when you buy these things? They're not FDA controlled. There's no few placebo controlled studies, no long-term uh, data on side effects. There's other stuff in them. There's filler. We don't know what it can do. So I, I think patients are wasting their money when they, you know, when the generics are so cheap. Question. There, there was a study that indicated if you're going to get prostate cancer, it could be a higher grade prostate cancer. Fairly flawed. Wasn't it? Wasn't it crazy how the the, the littlest studies that really haven't been done well, they don't have great, you know, controls, make the news. What's that? Yep, yep. So there you have it. Don't give blood, don't get a, a young chick pregnant if you want to take <laughs> finasteride. You heard it here first at Chicago Metro Suna. All right, moving along, surgery. Surgery still is an option, it's done. The options that we used for prostate is open prostate, usually used for large prostates, requires a general anesthesia, recovery from a surgical wound. Um, not done very often anymore because the residents don't learn how to do it, so it's an old timer's trick. Um, some of the robotic guys are, they do anything with the robots, so they are doing some of those. TERP was the gold standard for many years, that's the old transurethral resection of the prostate where you, that first picture, that little cheese cutter wire that cuts through and takes chips of the prostate out. However, you bleed a lot after that, and you need to have a large balloon, continuous bladder irrigation. Those of us who have taken care of those patients know they're very difficult to handle immediately post-op because of the bleeding. During the procedure, the doctor has to be very careful how long he's in there chipping away. It's a large prostate, and they're in there too long. They can absorb too much fluids, drop their sodium count, and dilute their blood, and, and to potentially die from that. So, um, most urologists that are trained know to watch for those things. But again, you know, you have to be careful. They have to be off anticoagulants and watch electrolytes and hemoglobin. What's replaced it are the minimally invasive surgeries. Um, in our practice, lasers the king. We do a lot of lasers, homium, um, mostly green light uh, XPS, green light laser. Um, there's some of this rollerball vapotrodes that was put out by ACMI. HIFU, high intensity focus ultrasound. We never did it. I don't know that it worked all that well. Tuna, anybody do tunas in their office years and years ago? I did. They, they didn't work very well. They were kind of a bloody mess and patients were not happy because it hurt. <laughs> but laser ablation done under a general anesthetic. It's an outpatient procedure. They go in there and they just basically get rid of tissue, which is the idea behind a TERP. If you can get rid of that tissue, they're going to urinate better and it's done by vaporizing the tissue so there's very little bleeding. Most of the time they go home with a catheter. There's several studies that say they can go home without a catheter depending on how much bleeding they have. 
Um, Holmium and the, uh, the uh, green light are the two biggies I think that most people are using to get rid of the prostate. Again, outpatient, they can resume anticoagulants quicker. They have to be off of them for the procedure. There's far less bleeding, no doubt. Um, but there is a drawback because in the old days, we found a certain number of prostate cancers in those prostate chips that they took out. So there's nothing to send off for a diagnosis. But the results are really, you know, nowadays with the urologists trained in this, their results are as good as the old fashioned TERP. Microwave therapy, this can be done in the office. I tend to think of this as the patient who's high risk for a haircut, so they can't really undergo surgery because of other problems, or maybe they can't go off of blood thinners for some reason, and they don't want to be stuck with a catheter the rest of their life. We've had some decent success. You know, if they've got a good bladder and a, not an overly huge prostate, you heat up it, the prostate with a microwave antenna, which is right here, that causes thermal destruction, and it uh, takes an hour to do, about two weeks to recuperate, and about eight weeks before they see the best results. But options that are available. Uh, again, the two that are I'm familiar with are the Thermatrix. We don't use that too much. The cooled one I like because it cools the urethra. They have less uh, complaints after the procedure from patients.